At this point, when I was recording my interviews for the show, it had actually been a few weeks since I got the train car that I want to turn into a studio slash recording space slash retail store, whatever I'm going to do with it. Right now, I was just trying to figure out where to start. One plan was to start testing out items to sell online. I mentioned when I was talking to Scott in the last episode that he had brought toys with him, and I have tons of toys that I've been collecting over the years. So one plan that I had was to start testing out how to sell them online. My thoughts are that I need to start up in my game as far as online sales. I want to be able to have as many things running in the background to help support me, and this is so I can avoid relying on freelance work as much as possible, so I can just make the things I want to do, do things that interest me. And that's the game plan, at least. And the setup can be done any time, even while I wait to open up this physical business that I'm talking about. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. <laughs> Also, one thing is that it was still cold out and the heat in the train was disconnected. So it was still prone to be cold out during the days. Some of the times when I had done these interviews and I had scheduled people to meet me there. So on occasion, I would move the interview over to the coffee shop next door, which was the case with the person that I meet today. I'm Sarah Meredith, also known as Smear Tactics, and I'm a printmaker, artist, and teacher in Madison. Sarah and I have actually tried to set up an interview several times in the past year. I don't know why we kept having trouble doing that, but we finally were able to sit down and talk. And while I love the name, I know that it's probably a play in words, but how did you come up with it? So I used to be one of a kind. My maiden name was Peckle, so I was Sarah Peckle. And while I used to sign all my artwork that way, there was no other. And then I got married, and my last name is Meredith. And so the name Sarah Meredith is very common. There are like hundreds of thousands of us. So I decided to try to find a name that would work. Um, so S-M-E-R-E is smear tactics. So taking a political term and changing it to mean something else. So you were like the wanna key of artists before is what you're saying. You were like <laughs> the only one that had that name. Yeah, yes. And then, so the political thing, I mean, would you say that you're politically motivated or it was just like, that's actually kind of catchy? Because it is. The whole mudslinging politically is something that totally turns me off. So I thought maybe I could take that term and, and, and have it be synonymous with something else. So art and community and all the other things that I try to do. So taking something that has like a negative reaction and making it a positive. When I first saw your stuff, I had to stop and read the name twice and go, so how do I say that? And then <laughs> finally I got it. So you got that going too. It's like, it's one of those you stop and have to take a second look. So let's talk about the style of your work. So you are doing block prints, but I know that you started out a different way or have you always done it that way? In high school, way, way, way back, uh, I used to do linoleum cuts and I dabbled in a lot of stuff. When I went to college, I went to UW Whitewater. I primarily focused on painting. So I painted, I went into the print industry as a printer and a finisher for large scale re retail graphics. So I did that for 10 years and I painted the whole time. And then when I was done with that, <laughs> then I, it was like one or two years, and then I hopped back into printmaking. So it's like, I've kind of always been a printer, but then like back and forth. But I think where I come at in the printmaking world is I'm not a traditional printmaker. Um, most printmakers have very tight lines, and it's very, very strategic where you place things. And I come at it from a painterly position. So I'm planning things and sketching things out in a more painterly fashion and then and then I carve it. And so my lines aren't like all super straight together and sometimes they are, but it's more loose. And you started doing more woodcuts instead of doing linoleum. Right. So why did why um, the switch? Why why one why instead of the other? Cuz wood carving is much harder. Actually, I think it's easier. <laughs> it's it's more accessible to find wood to cut on than it is to find linoleum. And something about having to, like, when you cut against the grain, like, you have to problem solve more. So things that are actually more difficult, <laughs> I, I enjoy more. But I actually started um, because I took a class at the library just down the road from us with a, an artist friend, Jenny Gao. And so then when I took that, I was like, uh-oh, I'm going to have to do this all the time now. So I just kind of 
like jumped ship and then like moved into wood cutting. So I think part of that is as a painter, people don't understand me around here. It's very chaotic and loose. And so if I take that and translate it into a woodcut, people understand more. Mm -hmm. And I'm also strictly trying to stay with black and white. So removing all the color and like having this constraint, it's easier for me to communicate what I want to communicate to people. It looks artful, but then I don't get all mixed up in the details, which I just hyper, like, instead of leaving part of a painting, like, partly unfinished or having more texture, I, like, go in and, like, define everything. And so I think that that loses some of the fun when you look at a painting. Is like, oh, that is that, or that image is that, and not seeing what you see in there. Because a lot of the stuff that I make, aside from the suitcase of curiosities, a lot of the other work comes from intuitive process. So I see faces in a bunch of lines, and then it becomes a thing. So I play around with sketches first, and then I'm like, oh, let's refine this into a woodcut. You also put it on different objects. None of my stickers right now are vinyl, because block printing ink does not adhere to vinyl. So you can use screen printing ink and let it thicken, but there's like a very rigid time frame before the ink just is too coagulated to use. I don't have the timing down for how long do I need to let a certain amount of screen printing ink sit out before I can roll it onto the block and print it directly to vinyl. You have some here that are actually stickers printed on one on her book pages and then the other one on... Wood veneer. wood veneer. So I need you to explain how you make these stickers. First, you have to print to whatever you're going to print to. So a porous surface works better. So paper's obviously a natural, but I also print on fabric for patches and stuff. And that's usually like a muslin, a fabric that's natural usually works the best. But, you know, I experiment all the time. So to make it a sticker, obviously you have to let that thing dry and cure for a while. But then... They have these Xyron sticker label, like, all-in-one machines, and they don't require electricity, but you can buy different inserts. So there's laminate with laminate backing, magnet with laminate top, which I do for my magnets, and then they also have repositionable adhesive or permanent adhesive. These are the repositionable adhesive. So if you were to stick it, you can remove it and stick it again, but within reason because it's a sticker. So how do you get, I, I get that you said you have a thing that puts the, uh, here's, here's my technical way, the thing that puts the sticky stuff on the back. <laughs> the It's like, I don't know, it's like 14 inches wide. It's got two rollers. Mm -hmm. And so the top opens up and it has this insert. So it's all in an, all in one. You buy it through Xyron or through Amazon or whatever. Several places sell it. Yeah. And you drop, like there's this groove, you drop this insert in and it's got the laminate roll on top and the magnet on the bottom or whatever you're using. And then these roller, once you put that in and you close the top, mm -hmm. then you use this crank and it rolls through a little bit and then you put your items through. And so they roll over and then the top stays on the top and the bottom stays on the bottom. Okay. So you're encapsulating whatever you're putting through. I could see in the future doing more like print your own, although that didn't go too well at the print and resist <laughs> because I couldn't be there. I had to keep walking across to the other table and I had written instructions, but you know, if people don't know the names of things, it's hard to like that thing with the roller on it, the thing that you rub the thing with, yeah. like, how do you explain these, you know, jargony terms that people don't immediately understand so people were putting my baron the thing that you use to rub the back of the print which i only know the name of because of martha stewart i just called it a roller yeah. no the roller that's right. just a that's roller a different thing. the baron is what you rub on the back but yeah. people were putting that in the ink and i was like oh i just have to keep washing my stuff off all day so at one point i was yeah. like i'm I'm just going to print a bunch and put them out here, and then, like, I'm going to wash my stuff up. Yeah. You just made me realize, though, too, that I was talking about a brayer, not the baron. And the, the roller is the brayer, and that's what I learned from Martha Stewart. And it's just like, I remember the first time I saw that, and I'm like, she's just being difficult. Just call it a roller. <laughs> oh, Martha. 
I talked to Sarah a bit about how she got started and where the inspiration for the things that she makes came from. You know, when you're so far into a project, like where, when did this even begin? And so I was thinking about that this morning in like mental prep for this. The suitcase of curiosities, which is all the stickers, the patches, the magnets, all of the like smaller art came from me learning more about myself that I am a multi-passionate person and I love so many different things mostly natural, so most of the stickers and stuff are based on natural items. But I also listen to a podcast called Ologies, and so what Allie Ward does in that podcast is she interviews a different ologist every episode. So somebody hyper-specialized in what they do, and her whole premise is ask smart people dumb questions because they want to talk about what they do. And what I was finding is like listening to all these episodes is like I already knew tidbits of what they were already talking about. And, and so I was like, whoa, but what if we could do that with art? And I'm not hyper specialized in any one thing necessarily, but people like a lot of different things. So giving people a way to express their curiosity about the natural world. And then also I'm a huge fan of Curiosities, Wunderkammer, however, Victorian cabinets of curiosity, all that kind of stuff. So back in the day when those were super popular, only wealthy people had them because they're the only ones with money to travel and bring back skulls and birds and stuff them and, you know, anything you could think of, rocks, all that kind of stuff. So taking that concept and making it bringing it forward to now and how can we make art more accessible to everyone so making smaller art in a traveling cabinet and not just i'm a rich person that has this thing making making it portable too so eventually the whole suitcase of curiosities will be a trailer specifically a gypsy wagon so i'm gonna wait is this something you're working up to it's it's far way 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 far out but like that would be the dream of where this would go is that i can create a wagon and have it totally fit so like if you walk into it it would be like you're walking into a, a cabinet of curiosity or a room of whatever a room of wonder is it going to be gallery based or is it really going to be like kind of oddities and like is it sellable stuff or art yeah sellable sellable stuff still like four inch by four inch stuff but then like I can also have art so I've already figured out the size it took me a you know a few runs to figure out like a nice size block Uh that I can go back to so then if I build like little frames or places to clip stuff and then I can have each print in a like tiny little drawer, like kind of like library catalog style. Mm -hmm. But the idea of traveling with it and not having to deal with museums and galleries and making my own scene, that really appeals to me. And also you can go anywhere. You're not limited to where you live or where you have connections. You can make those connections. And I think that that's really needed today. It's like, I would love to just go hang out on a farm for, Mm -hmm. for a day and like, Whoever shows up, shows up, or if it's, you know, that stuff I haven't figured out yet. How possible do you think it is, or close it is to actually happening? I mean, anything's possible if you really break it down into, I would think, like, five years in the future that it would be definitely happening. Um, I want to have a few more years to, like, really see where Suitcase of Curiosity, if, like, I know people really enjoy it, because I might have to tweak what I do with it. But in terms of, like, building a wagon, my... Soon to be brother-in-law, he is super excited about it because he likes to pimp out trailers. So, like, I think he, like, he's been sending me like Pinterest, like boards. So, how to get the money for that? You know, there's any amount of ways. Like, so I'm on Patreon. I thought, well, maybe I could use that as a Patreon. Like, maybe I create a very specific limited edition print to kickstart it, I'm thinking it'll probably be a crowdfunded sort of thing. I actually kicked around the idea of being in a trailer when I decided to do this business experiment that I'm in the middle of right now. I mean, it's still an interesting option. I can still try and sell online from anywhere. With what Sarah's talking about, I wondered what the online market was for her style of work and what kind of stuff she was using. How much would you say that you sell online? Actually, I just spent the entire day yesterday trying to make 
Instagram shoppable, which you have to wait for their approval, which yes. I'm like, how long do I wait before I'm like, that didn't work? Like, yeah. how long do you wait? It, there's no written, like, it takes this long. You have to make and create a catalog on Business Manager on Facebook and, and then have your shop. And then because Facebook and Instagram are linked, then they're supposed to just know. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. that process is a little, like, ah. Uh, because I don't have Shopify or WooCommerce or any of that stuff connected to my website. So I ultimately was like putting everything on my website and I'm like copying it and putting it in the catalog. I am not selling single stickers. Like I'm, I'm trying it right now just for a short time to say like, oh, this is the only time I'm gonna sell these singers, single stickers online. Cause it's just not, it's too much listing and it's not worth it for like a small ticket item. I hand print all of mine. Mine are all like on actual material. I don't go on an app and print them. You know, like I could see myself doing certain designs that way. Just part of me just really likes the handmade quality of like this is a unique sticker. Some people tell me I should charge more than $5 for a sticker, but then I also like want it to be accessible. This is the small stuff. I work on like 500 other projects at the same time I'm doing all this. What are some of the other things you do? I mean, I know you do a lot of local shows and what works for you in the sense that you're able to do this? So I left my job three and a half years ago almost and I was working in the printing industry and if I stuck with that for a long time because there's a bunch of creativity and problem solving. But at, at one point I was like, ah, there's no creativity left here for me. I have to get out. Mm -hmm. And also like when they lay off all of your good friends, like you have no incentive to stay, right? So I was like, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to make it happen. And so I've been really patient in the income making sector because when you become an entrepreneur and you become a full-time artist, you have a lot of stuff to figure out. So it takes a long time, like you even imagine in your head, because there's a lot of stuff to work through. Like you have to be everything. You have to be your accountant. You have to be your own boss. You have to actually make the work. You have to market the work. And I ideally would like to hire people for that. But just last year I broke even. So I feel like that's pretty good. But Madison is very difficult for me I find it difficult to get into shows here. Part of that is because I don't really like writing, and so it's been very interesting to like hone my writing process because around here, like artist statements are super important, yeah. and writing proposals and all that. And and because I feel like I'm not confident in my writing abilities, and that's super important when you're trying to get shows and stuff. But also, like shows for me, I actually sell more stuff at places that are not galleries. Hmm. So places like coffee shops or music places, like I have some stuff at Jiggy Jams. Wait, what's you know, Jiggy Jams? A vinyl place on Fordham Avenue. Okay. You should go there. For the name alone, I should go there. Yeah, they have all kinds of stuff. It's all categorized. You can sell them old vinyl and he'll resell it. And So he has some of my stickers there. I also have stuff at Communication, which is a multi-purpose art space. That has been really good for me and it's very inclusive. So I tend to do better in places that have overlap, which makes sense to me if I think about it because I'm a multifaceted person. So it makes sense that many of my overlapping interests are also people that like my stuff. And how are you approaching these people? Communication, I'm friends with an artist that founded it, Jennifer Bastion. So she was one of the co-founders and I stopped by the space and I was just kind of like, oh, hey, I'd like stuff in the front. And because it's an inclusive space, like you can approach them very easily and, you know, like, hey, can I have stuff here? And you volunteer there too, yeah. don't you? Yeah. Okay. It's been every other month lately. I love working there because it's new every time I go. The emphasis isn't on necessarily every individual individual piece of art it's on the community of art there which is the whole shtick like mm -hmm. they're very focused on community and so I think that feeling comes across when you have a mishmash or a juxtaposition of stuff and and if everyone is welcome then you as organizer of a shop have to put things together even if you as a curator wouldn't want to put those things together you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. like you have to you have to let art have its own conversation. And in many gallery spaces, you don't get that. Like, there are galleries that hang things gallery style, which I find is an interesting term for, like, stacking art because most galleries will just have all the white space around, which is cool. Yeah. Um, but I really like 
a bunch of art having a conversation as if the people were like having a conversation themselves. I kind of wanted to know more about executing ideas. I can conceptualize things in my head, but of course, when I'm done working on them, I always feel like there has to be a better way to do it. So I thought I'd ask Sarah what she does. Do you ever map it out or do you just kind of go, I think I'm going to try this? I do have maps and then for whatever reason, if they don't work, then I scrap it. Most of it's in my head or in a notebook. And once it's in a notebook, I don't think about it. Like I can go back to it. It's like a Harry Potter pensive. Like I drop all my thoughts in there. You lost me on that one. I'm very sorry. Okay. I'll, a little background. I read all the Harry Potter books because they... <laughs> I did not. I fell asleep during the first Harry Potter movie, and that's the last I time I... So it's like, so the Pensieve, the wizard people, like, they take their thoughts with their wand, and they put it in their wand, and they dip their wand into this big vat. And, like, so they can go in, and they can see their memories. Like, they can go into this cauldron, if you will, okay. and it'll show them their memory that they were thinking about, or, oh, that thought. And so I think of it as a good metaphor for... I have to get this stuff out of my head or I go crazy because I am constantly full of ideas. So if it goes somewhere and I know it's out, then I know I can refer back to it. The marketing plan is ever evolving. And so I find that I like if I have to map it out, I just get bored. Okay. Like, all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, in theory, that Harry Potter thing, it's like, wow, that sounds fantastic. I wish that were real. And then the more I thought about it, it's like, nope, that is real. So that is essentially my Google Drive account. I put yeah, stuff oh in God. there, and then I go, I'm going to save that for later. And you know what? When you, The more thoughts you put in there, it's like, where the hell is that thing? It's just another place to file stuff away and can't find it. I took a Creative Live session, and it happened to be free, with Lisa Congdon. So she's a pretty world-renowned illustrator, but the way that she figured out how to deal with multiple projects at once and like multiple deadlines and all that kind of stuff is that she has what she calls a workflow. So she'll be like, these are all the projects I need to accomplish. These are my long-term projects, short-term projects. So she'll have items in there and then she'll break those into deadlines. Okay, like I need to do this by a certain day. And even if she doesn't accomplish it by that certain day, it like breaks those goals down. And then from there, she'll create a priority list for the week. Okay, where are all these things that I have to do? She'll create a priority list, and from then, she'll do time blocking for the week. And I kind of do a little bit of all of it, because when you figure out a system for yourself, you have to know how you work. I think the main reason I asked Sarah that question was because a couple of weeks had gone by since I got on the train car, and I felt like I had not done anything yet. And I was just having a hard time even knowing where to begin. I was really looking for inspiration or a kick in the pants to get me moving, just something. And as we talked more about projects that we were doing, we discussed the struggle to get by making the things that mean the most to us personally. What do you think appeals to people about what you make? Because clearly you're making something that you like. Why do you think other people like it? I think there is a sense of inclusivity. I think, I'm not entirely certain. The people that follow me on Instagram, the people who buy in person aren't necessarily the same people or the same people that will walk up and like, talk to me at a show because those people aren't necessarily on Instagram and men buy without even thinking like they come up and they'll be like I want that I'm taking it and I didn't think men like my stuff at all like primarily women are drawn to my stuff there is definitely a population of people that love the patches like they will just buy all of the patches because they love patches and because mine are black and white they're not super colorful they can go with a lot of different things mm -hmm. so also I because I have lots of choices for one same item people can choose what they want so it's like a choose your own adventure how do you want to interact with me mm -hmm. and so yeah I'm still I'm still figuring that stuff out because I think the the audience for different projects of what I do is slightly different you know like I can't get out of my own head sometimes yeah. so I talk to people about it and then like and then I just go off the deep end because what they say will like give me a thousand other ideas of okay. like who it is um I do think that sciencey people like my stuff just like the suitcase of curiosity is very science-based mm -hmm. and because it's based in nature so I talk to I try to welcome whoever wants to be there yeah. which I think is a different outlook yeah. you know like Whoever you are, <laughs> you're welcome here. There is another project that she has coming up that she's pretty excited about. Into the Deep, which is something that has been ongoing for over a year. 
is my huge, huge woodcut project. Eight panels, four foot by four foot, about if you were to to like be able to drop into the depths of the ocean, like Mariana Trench, Hadel Zone, what would happen if you could do that and what would you see? It's a metaphor for finding yourself in the darkness, in the deep, because you have to do that to get to the other side of anything, mm -hmm. to be a whole person, to... There's so much I could say. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's a metaphor for that, like the deep psyche stuff, but also to bring awareness to all the creatures of the deep, which we only know. We've only mapped like 2% of the bottom of the ocean floor, which is crazy. We can go into space, but we can't even go to the depths of the ocean. It's that's where all the monsters are. <laughs> well, there are some very monstrous looking things, but I find them fascinating. Like bioluminescence, the ability to create your own light, that many of these creatures have is the number one form of communication on the planet. Mind blown. Mm -hmm. I read that in a children's book <laughs> to my child, and I was like, I got to make art about this. Um, so that's a long-term project, and then there's a lot of stuff that go with the woodcuts, so bioluminescent fish and all kinds of creatures, and then there's also a body, a figure in there. It's more of a woman, but it could be anybody. You know, it's kind of androgynous because I want it, anybody to be like, oh, that could be me, dropping into the depth of the ocean, finding myself. Um, so each of the bioluminescent creatures will get painted with glass paint, and it'll be, I think it'll be at communication. Oh, cool. we're, we're still talking about it because I have to actually make the work. But uh, <laughs> That will make it better, yeah. But it'll be mostly dimly lit, and then I'm giving everybody, like, an LED light oh, so cool. that they can explore. And, like, the glass paint will make is, like, safety paint that's on the sidewalk and stuff, so it'll reflect back to you, like, it is bioluminescent. Mm. And projections and local music and all that kind of stuff is what happened on top of me talking about that to Tessa at communication. Yeah. Who's, her mother is an oceanologist, which I was like, oh. holy poop, how, did, how do these things happen? I know somebody whose mom is an oceanographer, how awesome is that? Yeah. Because yeah. obviously I'm a big sea creature lover, Clearly. but I also I'm horribly afraid of drowning. <laughs> so it's also like conquer, fear conquering to mm -hmm. make work about things in the depth of the ocean that make my heart like, <sighs> yeah. I, uh, I don't know, I don't know. Be yeah. like dr diving off of a plane would be the same thing for me. I have no interest in doing that ever. <laughs> but that's, that's a huge project that I'm working on that hopefully the first show would be sometime next year. Okay. So it's a l long, because I, I also have to figure out how to print four foot by four foot woodcuts. Because a steamroller is not wide enough when I, so I created a problem for myself because I didn't look up a steamroller width before I started. I was just like, I like the square format. So now I have to be like, can I print it with a car? And if I have like multiple boards and somehow drive and disperse the weight of the car, oh. or do I just do it by hand or find somebody with a huge press that I can be like, can I pay you this much yeah. to come and print in your studio? Which means I would have to have them all cut and ready. So it, ta it takes about a month to cut one. So I'm, I'm like one and a half in. I have progress on Instagram of those. And okay. it's under the into the deep. I have a, like a hashtag for it, but I'm sure there's other stuff under into the deep because I mean that could. I'm almost afraid to find out what it is. <laughs> I, looked, I looked into it before I hash, like used the hashtag like, is this going to be creepy? And yeah. I think at the time it was okay. So I want to say that it, it's not as bad as okay. you think it's going to be. Yeah. You know, after we recorded this episode, Sarah had posted something on her Instagram a few days later. I'm, I'm going to read part of it here, but basically what she said is, I recently decided to stop caring about if I fit in, in the art world or anywhere else. In my talk with Tom Ray for his podcast, I kind of realized that I was unwittingly trying to fit into multiple worlds, groups, and even movements. I do constantly compare myself to other artists who have shows and galleries and sell lots of art and get curated into shows, etc. Instead of thinking about how I should be or do X, I'm going to drop it and do whatever feels right. And I responded, holy crap, I'm super flattered our talk actually affected you in that way. I'm not really sure how to react except for good for you, smiley face heart emoji. <laughs> 
You can see more of Sarah's work at her website, smeartactics.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, head over to my site at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe, where you can sign up for the mailing list or find all the links to the other things that I'm doing. Or if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. That's AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music for this show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. Thanks for listening. And until the next episode, so long. <laughs>